This is Angelo Pizzullo, manager of the Oral History Program with the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Sunday, August 11, 2019. We are on board the Battleship New Jersey, and our interview guest is Robert Hochter from Radcliffe, Ohio. Mr. Hochter served on USS New Jersey as a hospital corpsman during the Vietnam Commission. Welcome home, Mr. Hochter. And what is your current age? I'm 71. All right. When did you enlist? I enlisted uh, before my senior year in high school was over, uh, it was probably May of 1966. All right. And how old were you when you actually joined the Navy? 18. All right. Now, um, what was the inspiration for going into the Navy? It was during the Vietnam conflict and everybody was going to end up being redrafted or whatever, you know, and I thought there was more educational opportunities if I enlisted into the Navy rather than be drafted into the General okay. Army. All right, uh, before we can continue, if I may, would you be so kind to remove your hat because of the shadows? Thank you. All right. Now, uh, describe the process of enlisting in the Navy for you. Went to see a recruiter and that was, you know, and then we, uh, we had to take a physical and everything like that. And that's pretty much down. That's just about all there was to it, really. All it right. Wasn't any problem to it. Now, um, where did you go to boot camp? Great Lakes in Chicago, Illinois. All right. Do you have any stories uh, that you'd like to share from boot camp? Any memories? No. Nah. All right. I can't remember too much about boot camp. Mm -hmm. Now, did you go to any A schools? Yeah, I went to hospital core school, and I went to that at Great Lakes, too. All right. Any stories from that experience? I uh, don't really. All right. Now, before uh, you were on board the New Jersey, this was, uh, you did your training in 1966, correct? Yes. All right. Um, before the Battleship New Jersey, uh, what was your assignment? And just tell us about every your everyday duties on that assignment. Well, I was assigned to uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital, and I was going to go to pharmacy technician school at, at Portsmouth. And I had extended for six months to get that school. And then I was stationed there for like from springtime till in the fall when the school was supposed to start. And right before the school started, they came back and told me I'd have to extend for another 18 months to go ahead and get my, go to the school. And I'd already extended six months. So I told them, no, I'm not going to that school. So they said, well, you'll, Either you'll get another assignment then, and uh, it'll either be with the Marine Corps Division or Marine Corps Detachment in Vietnam or a ship. So it, at that time, they was going to recommission in New Jersey. So there were several of us that dropped out of the pharmacy school program at that time. So there was like three of us from there that got assigned to the USS New Jersey. And what was your reaction when you first got the word that you would be assigned to the battleship? Oh, I was happy. It was an honor, you know. Was everybody everybody was going, man, you get assigned to the New Jersey, it's the only battleship in the world, you know. And hadn't been one in commission since Korea. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was happy about it. All right. Now, where did you meet up with the battleship? In Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. They sent us to California for re re uh, recommissioning school. We went out there for like firefighting school and stuff. They didn't have enough room for the whole crew on the East Coast, so they sent us to 32nd Street Naval Station in San Diego, and we was out there from January until about last of April. And then he came back, or no, no, last of uh, March. But we came back here and then we recommissioned a ship, of course, on April 6, 1968. Right. So let's backtrack a little bit. So the first time you saw USS New Jersey, what was your reaction? It was impressive. It was in dry dock at the time. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it just looked like it was a, well, you know what a dry dock was. It was this great big slot, and the ship was sitting there, and it was all blocked up and everything. So that's when the first time I saw it, it was actually in dry dock in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And your, just do you remember your reaction? Just 
Well, looking yeah, at it. it was impressive. I mean, you know, it was huge, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, All right, so were you on board for the commissioning ceremony? Yes, I was. Uh, could you uh, just talk about the, what you go through as someone uh, watching the ship come to life, as the Navy says? Yeah, well, I had, I had my family here. Uh, my girlfriend and my brother was home from the Air Force. He came, my mother and father and her mother and father. And they came up for the recommissioning ceremony. And the funny, the thing about, not the funny thing about, but the thing about that was, was if you recall, Martin Luther King was assassinated just about right around that time. Mm -hmm. So when we left, when we left the base, you know, they, we had liberty and stuff. And when I left the base with my family and stuff, we had to go to uh, uh, our hotel and stay there because of Philadelphia was kind of on a lockdown at that time because mm -hmm. of uh, the unrest and everything. So that was one thing that was that was different about the recommissioning ceremony. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the ceremony itself? Um, do you remember Captain Snyder speaking? Um, anything that stands out from observing? Yeah, I remember him speaking, but there's nothing really that stood out at that time. No. All right. So let's uh, fast forward a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, just not so much your job duties, but your everyday life on board. You know, when you were done your duties, and we'll talk about your duties momentarily. Uh, what was it like after you, like after you pulled your shifts or watches? Um, what were some of the things you did? You know, what was the food like? Uh, anything like that, just well, general life. the food life. on this ship was always great. I mean, it was, it, was some, it was the best food I had the whole time I was in the military, was on board this ship. Mm -hmm. Heck, we ate good. You know, a lot of scallops, a lot of lobster tails. I mean, you know, food was really good. And the cooks were really good. Uh, uh, did you celebrate your birthday on board? And did you get to enjoy the cake that Captain Snyder always seemed to have? Uh, no, I don't never remember celebrating any birthday. I was, I was on board here for a couple birthdays, but mm -hmm. I don't remember any special celebrations on Yeah. All right. Um, so what else? Uh, what other things from everyday life? Well, sit around playing guitars and stuff, you know. We did it down the brig. Brig was empty. They didn't use the brig while we, you know, it was... It was just an empty space, and, and we'd go down there and play because the acoustics were real good, you know. Mm -hmm. um, sit around, polish shoes, guys talk, you know. Just like normal everyday life, really, you know. Um, movie Actually, entertainment? Any, huh? any movie entertainment? What yeah, they had, remember? They, we had closed circuit television on here, and they'd have a mm -hmm. movie every now and then, you know. And... Uh, yeah, well, they had a pretty, they had a nice library on here, but mm -hmm. I don't know, that's 50 years ago, man. You can't right. That. Understood. Um, so talk about uh, your duty station and, and your job on board. Okay, I was a HM2. Uh, I made HM2 right before we got back to the ship, you mm -hmm. know, or right before we left. Uh, well, when we got back to Philadelphia from from California. Uh, I made HM2, so they put me in charge of the sick call treatment room. And that was like, it was sort of like the emergency room for, you know, if you had sick call every day, the guys would come down if they had a medical problem or something. And I was in charge of the room where we'd screen them. And, I, and we had two doctors on board, Dr. Quinn and Dr. Denby. And uh, we'd, I'd either take care of the problem, you know, and our, if they had a cough, I'd just let you send them to the pharmacy for some cough syrup or something. But if it's something where the doctor had to see him, that was my decision to just, as to whether he needed to really be seen by a doctor or not. Right. And right. if somebody got injured, we sutured them up, you know, and uh, if we could, if they was injured real bad, of course, they got sent out, you know, but uh, just... Normal everything, you know, like sick call and treatment, and treatments if somebody would get, because you're on a, a ship, you know, it's like a mini factory, you had guys getting injured. So they'd be bandage changes, you know, normal. 
given the sh uh, normal uh, immunizations and things like that. So just treatments, mm -hmm. you know. And for the record, uh, could you um, describe what an HM2 is in the Navy? That's a hospital in second class. That's an E5, mm -hmm. the equivalent to sergeant in the Army. All right. Now, uh, what about your general quarter station? Where were you stationed? Officer's ward room. I had good general quarter station. Mm -hmm. I was in the officer's ward room. There was uh, a doctor and a chaplain, me, and that, you know, just various different people in there. But we just, that's where we went during general quarters. All right. Did you have a particular watch station outside of your other duties? No. All right. All right. Um, now, we did have an incident on board, a uh, serious accident with a sailor, uh, Seaman Andy Tobias, mm -hmm. um, that you um, were part of that uh, process in which it eventually uh, not only saved his life, but his leg. Uh, could you uh, just tell us what you remember of that and describe what you did and well, how we were, reacted? We were just in, a, in, I was in my duty station, which was a sick call treatment room. And the call came out that there was a guy injured in, down in the turret. So uh, we had a couple other corners. We had grabbed our unit ones and went down there. And uh, he he got his leg in between. They were inventorying the rounds or something. You know how the circle rail brings the rounds up. Mm -hmm. And there was some miscommunications or something. And he got his leg caught in between two of the 16-inch projectiles, which did some damage to him. So we went down there and got him stabilized and then we had to put him in this, had to pull him up through the hatch, you know, because he he was down below the deck. So I had a, a special stretcher put him in there and strap him in real good and then just pull him up through there. He wasn't really, it, it, the, I think it was number two turret, so he wasn't very far away from the sick bay area actually. So we brought him up and got him up there and got him stabilized and then sent him off the ship. You know. Did um, they perform surgery on the ship? No, no, he got sent right out. Okay. All right. Um, now, did you ever have a chance to meet Captain Snyder? Yeah, I dealt with Captain Snyder. Mm -hmm. And know, what was he like and what was his command style and what stood out about him? Normal guy. You know, mm -hmm. normal guy, you know, very personable. I have one good story about him, you know. Well, we didn't have to wear caps when we were underway. You know, a lot of ships, they had strict regulations, and if he was up on the deck, you had to wear your cap. We didn't have to do that. And a lot of guys got their hats blow off, you know, and they'd always replace some hats because they got blowed off. Well, if we went on the deck and we was underway, you didn't have to wear a hat, you know. And that was one thing from it, and but just like, all of, yeah, just a lot of things. He was he was a very personable guy. He was really nice, mm -hmm. and he would come down to the sick bay, you know, and visit in every now and then. A couple times he was sick, you know, he'd get you know everybody get sick. He'd get a cold or not feeling well, and he'd be in his quarters, and we'd have to go up and check on him, you know, take medicine up and stuff. And, He's always just down to earth, very nice guy. I got one story I can relate to him. Please do. It's like when I was I was an E three E four and I just made E five. I hadn't sewn it on yet, right? So it was Easter weekend, so I went home for the weekend. You know, back then I don't know if you ever flew military standby or not. Mm -hmm. You know how you get bumped off flights. Well, you know, I was a young guy. I'd like 19 or something like that. So I went home and uh, it was pretty right around Easter weekend, you know, and uh, pretty busy. So I got bumped off flight. And we were going to do underway training, you know, the next day. And, and I knew I had to get back. So anyway, I got bumped off my flight. So I finally got a flight out and I, I called the ship and told them I'm probably going to be and I'm not going to make first muster, you know. And they said, well, if you make ship's movement, you'll be all right, because we were going out on underway training. So I, I come in, we're coming in down, if you're Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, you know, there's a big long lane, goes down a tree line lane, it goes down, I look up, 
tell that cab driver is a big uh, cloud of black smoke. I said, you see that black smoke? That's the that's the Jersey. It's getting <laughs> underway, and I got to be on that ship. So he got me down there. Well, I get down there with the ship's like eight feet from the dock, churning up water, getting ready, pulling out. So uh, one of the dock workers, black gentleman, yeah, I was, come on, Doc, get over here. They had the acro brow, and they hooked it up four corners. And I got on the acro brow, and the crane took me over and swung me <laughs> over, and I jumped off the acro brow onto the deck. Well, of course, I was taken into custody right away, coming on board the ship like that. And the officer of the deck was there, and uh, somebody said, the captain's on the ship, uh, on that thing. He wants to know who came aboard by crane back there, you know. So they gave him my name and all that stuff, and then there was dead silence. I was thinking, I'm not going to be E5, I'm going back to E3, you know. Mm -hmm. I was E4, done. And the officer deck says, what's the captain say about this? So I'm just standing there, it seemed like forever, and I'm just thinking about how I'm going back down to E3. And then he just... It came back and he said, Captain says, tell the doc welcome aboard. <laughs> and that's all it came out. Of course, I got a little bit of discipline from my own division because, mm -hmm. you know, the chiefs and one doctor didn't uh, really care for that kind of stuff, you know. But I, I got a little bit of discipline from them. It wasn't bad. No. And I didn't, I, I went to E5. I didn't go back to E3. But I'd never forget that, that officer deck saying, what's the captain say? And they said, he said, tell the doc welcome aboard. Well, just that effort alone, you should be getting, you should have all charges <laughs> dismissed. But yeah. I got to give that dock worker some credit, too. Mm -hmm. You know, he had, they had the crane there, and they had the acrobrow, and they had to hook two more cables on there, and then I just stood on the acrobrow, and they got me over as close as I could throw my bag on and jump, you know. <laughs> That's dedication, I got to say. That's a, <laughs> that's a great story. All right. So uh, you were on board for the Bob Hope show. Yes. Um, could you tell us about that and what you remember and who were some of the other guests with Bob Hope? Mm, and Margaret and Bob Hope. I, I really don't remember that much about it. I mean, I, mm -hmm. it was, I remember it was up on the forward part of the ship, you know, up on the bow, and uh, we thought, and it kind of slopes up like this. And they was on top. They had they were set up on top of number two turret, I believe, number one or number two. I don't mm -hmm. know. But that they put the show on up there, and it was enjoyable, you know. All right, all right. Uh, now, before uh, you were getting ready to depart to come home after the first um, time on the gun line. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a diversion to North Korea. Yeah, I can't remember that. I had a couple of those when I was in the service. Mm -hmm. One was they shot down an EC-121, and one was they captured the Pueblo. Well, I can't remember whether it was the Pueblo or the EC-121. I believe for this one it was the uh, EC-21. Yeah. That well, was... yeah, we. I was I. Uh, I was a young man at the time. I was still only like twenty. And my mm -hmm. girlfriend was like a senior in high school, so I was going to get home for her her uh, senior prom. And then we was like, what, two days out of Long Beach? And all of a sudden, the Coral Seas was with us, the, the, the carrier Coral Sea, and all these, uh, I think uh, a couple DDGs and a cruiser maybe. But all of a sudden, we're going along, we're going the other direction. They're going out of thing, and we're turning around, going the other direction. And nobody, everybody, nobody knew anything. Nobody knew what the heck was going on. We just knew that the Coral Seas was still heading for Long Beach, and we was going back the other direction. So we went to uh, Yokosuka, Japan. In the meantime, we found out what had happened, you know, and uh, went into Yokosuka. Of course, they didn't want us there because they didn't want an incident with North Korea. So we went out to see a Japan floated around for a couple of weeks and then came back to Long Beach. But I did miss the prom. Uh -huh. I would have made it if we'd have made the course and come home. It was mm -hmm. all planned, but that didn't happen. All right. Now, um, 
let's uh, go a little more lighthearted. Uh, be, any ports of call stand out? And All of them. What's your favorite? Uh, Just names, uh, if you can remember some of them that you stopped at, and then uh, if you have a personal favorite, and why? Singapore. You know, uh, along the Poe got, you know, Philippines, that was old hat after a while. You know, that was where we always went back to. I liked Japan, but mm -hmm. the one that stood out the most was Singapore. Uh, any reason why that you'd like to share? It was just different. You know, mm -hmm. it was kind of, the. They, it was more modern. It had like, uh, seemed like the highways were more like they were here. You know, they had, they were like nice thing. And uh, just something about the air there, the kind of music and stuff, the different quality of the clubs and stuff. It was, Singapore was my favorite. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did you have any travels through the Panama Canal and were you on deck while yes, you were I doing was. that? Can you describe that? Interesting. They had to take all the scuppers off the side of the ship, and it was only like, what, a foot and a half extra clearance. So we went through there and scraped the side of the ship up pretty good. And I remember being in those mountain lakes, but that was funny because you had all these little mountain peaks sticking out of this lake up there, and it was like you could look out and it was, you could tell you were in the mountains and you're on a battleship, you know. So. It, we, it took a couple of days, I think, to get through the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. but it was it was interesting, you know. All right. Now, um, did you ever cross the equator? And if you did, um, yes, did you I have did. to do a I little became, ceremony. I was a polywog and became a shell back when we crossed the equator. And I crawled the whole. If you come here and see the New Jersey and see the, the size of it. We called, crawled the whole perimeter of the whole entire ship on our hands and knees, getting whacked with a fire hose, you know. <laughs> Enough so you knew it, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was where you was in any danger or anything. They, they just picked on it. It was a whole day. They got you up early and kept after you all day, and it ended late at night, and at night then you were, you were shell back. All right. Do you still have your shell back card? I've probably lost that thing. Well, I think I have a, a certificate, mm -hmm. and I haven't seen it in years. It's due to way of my stuff, but okay. yeah. And is it true that the certificate actually becomes part of your naval record permanently? Have you ever heard that? I have never. I've never heard anything about that, but I imagine it does. You know, the Navy holds uh, the shellback ritual. They hold that pretty dear. It it mean it means something. Right. Now, this is a new question related to that, since you were the, uh, hosp one of the hospital corpsmen. Uh, the day after the shellback ceremony, did you have to do any treatments for bruises or anything like that? Nah. So, nah. there was some stinging, nah. but nobody was seriously hurt. Oh, yeah. You, well, there's a lot of raw, raw, raw knees, I'm mm -hmm. telling you, from crawling around the whole circumference of the or whole diameter of the perimeter of the New Jersey on your hands and knees. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, did you get a chance to see the uh, guns fire, and what's that like? We're talking about the 16-inch 50 caliber guns. Oh, that plenty of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They went, like, they had a bombing hole in 68, you know, and we wouldn't, and a lot of times they'd be firing number three turret or number one or number two turret, and if, and if we wasn't at general quarters, then you could go aft if they's firing forward, you know, or forward if they's firing out. And you could sit outside and watch them shoot and stuff. Mm. The, the one time that I remember the most was they fired all night during Tet of 68. Mm. I mean, we, they fired, I forget how many rounds of 5-inch 38s and 16-inch stuff. Didn't get any sleep that night because they, they fired all night long, mm. you know. And, uh, that was interesting. All right. Now, um, when you finally came home, were you on board the New Jersey for her? Well, what, let me ask you this. Let me rephrase that. Um, did you get the orders that the New Jersey was being decommissioned? And what was that like? What was the reaction of you, the crew in general, when that word came down? Yeah, everybody was disappointed, but I knew I was leaving anyway. I was. I'd had orders already. I left 4th of July, 
1969, they decommissioned it what, a little bit over a month later. Right. And so uh, I wasn't around for the decommission. Mm -hmm. I was, matter of fact, one day the decommission was in September. Or, yeah, I, I was, was already back in Vietnam with the Marine Corps by then. Okay. So, all right, so let's talk about your post-military life, uh, life with the New Jersey. Where yeah. did you go after you disembarked? You mean left the yeah left, left in New Jersey before I got out of the military right just uh, okay, what did you do I after went New to, Jersey uh, I went home on leave mm -hmm. for thirty days and I went to Camp Pendleton for field medical school uh, which is sort of like a abbreviated Marine Corps boot camp for corpsmen and uh, then in September I was back in Vietnam with the First Battalion Fourth Marines and then. After several months there with them, then they uh, had troop withdrawal, sent us back to Okinawa. We were still on alert, I mean, you know, but that we were we were up like up around a DMZ, Third Marine Division was in I Corps, so they pulled us back and sent us to Okinawa, and then we were on ready alert all the time till I got out of service. And, but uh, that's I would. I did the rest of my time in service as a FMF corpsman with the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And do you uh, want to share anything of your experience during that time? No. Okay. Now, when did you get out of the Navy? August the 11th, 1970. All right. So let's uh, talk about your post-Naval life. Um, you have jobs, family, career. Uh, bring us up to date to today. Well, I got out of service and went to welding school. Mm -hmm. I went to work for, uh, I worked for several little places, but my main job that I had at that time, I went to work for Peabody Coal in the United Mine Workers as a, as a welder. I worked for them for 20 years. Uh, I was only, for, they shut the mine down by the Clean Air Act. So they was going to retrain the coal miners. So I we used my medical experience, went back to, got an, a degree, a RN degree and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree and mm -hmm. retired from the VA. I worked for, I had open heart surgery in 2011 and retired. So I had enough time in that I have retired from the mine workers and retired from the federal government in the VA. So. Okay. All right. How about family? I have three kids. I was I was married for 15 years and ended up getting divorced. I have my son. He's the oldest. Mm -hmm. I have two daughters. Uh, one's an x-ray tech and the other one is an RN. I like to follow in my footsteps and she's an RN. And uh, had a good life. Uh, grandkids? Got grandkids and one great grandson. All right. Congratulations. Now, is this the first time you've been back to New Jersey since you left? Yes. And uh, when you were coming up to pier today, what was your reaction to seeing her again? Of, yeah, actually, it was kind of emotional. We could see it from where you know the little gate out here. We could mm -hmm. see, I could see the superstructure. And I was getting a feeling because I hadn't seen the ship in 50 right. years, you know. Right. But you, and you noticed some of the modernizations from the 80s, yeah. but she oh, still yeah. pretty much looks the same overall? Outside, inside, mm -hmm. looks totally different to me. <laughs> I mean, you know. I even uh, like the sick bay, my sick call treatment room, it, it, it's in the same place. And I could tell that where the x-ray department was, where, where the surgical part mm -hmm. is, is right beside it. And then you have the ward area over here. But they had changed things. Uh, where the medical laboratory, where the laboratory is now was the pharmacy and the lab when I was just at one little place. Mm -hmm. Now they have the pharmacy over here and they built that in and had the, they added a little bit there to make it, the pharmacy is separate uh, now. And they're just, just little changes. But in the compartments where we stayed, I, I, I have a hard time even figuring out where I, I, I thought I'd recognize it immediately when mm -hmm. I got back there, but no, it's, there's a lot of changes there. Right. Do you kind of have a general idea of where? Oh, I had an idea. I think okay. I figured out where, probably where my bunk was and everything, but I couldn't see it because they'd build another wall or something. All right. So um, just a little reflective question. Um, 
what impact on your life did Naval Service have? I, I retired as an RN. I was a mm -hmm. hospital corpsman, so obviously it had some effect. When I got laid off from the coal mine, I thought I'd have a job there for life and never have to. And then when it shut down, I had enough time to retire. I had 20 years, but I was still too young to retire, so I had to do something else. So the obvious thing for me was to go back in the medical field. So mm -hmm. I went back to RN school. So the Navy gave me that, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, it helped you grow up. I was, I, I, like I say, I enlisted before I graduated from high school. And by the time I got out, I was 22. So I was a little more developed and a little more mature by the time I got out. All right. And one final question. This is more of a legacy slash time capsule. Mm -hmm. um, is there any message you would like to leave for historians or uh, educators in the future uh, about your time in general and your time specifically as both a sailor and an American? No, not really. I, you know, I, I have no regrets about my, you know, a lot of people might say, well, the worst thing I ever did is going into service and everything like that. But no, I, it was all beneficial. I have nothing negative to say about my military time at all. All right. I wouldn't do it any other way. All right. Any other last stories that might've come to mind? Nah, not really. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, close out. Uh, again, thank you for your service and taking time to join us. This concludes our interview. This is Angelo Pizzullo, manager of the Oral History Program on board the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Sunday, August 11th, 2019. Our interview guest was Robert Hockner from Radcliffe, Ohio. This recording and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey, the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project, and the New Jersey State Library System. All recordings will be made available to writers, researchers, teachers, and historians. And this is Angelo Pizzullo signing off.